Hi guys, welcome to the Revive Stronger podcast. I'm your host, Steve Hall, and we have another Q&A with Dr. Mike Isretel from Renaissance Periodization. And uh, I just wanted to know, Mike, first of all, my question is, how do you get pumped for these podcasts? What's your uh, method? I take a cold shower. Cold shower. Because I have to, you know, just wake up. I usually walk on pins and needles, uh, you know, stuff like this, just the regular stuff, you know, nothing too crazy. Not, I tend to hyperventilate a little bit beforehand. So uh, it's a good idea. sometimes, I mean, you've seen me black out on these before, so it doesn't quite work out. <laughs> it's worth the risk though. <laughs> anyway, so right, we're getting straight into these proper questions now. And uh, we have one from Aiden Vasugi, um, who has asked, when training around your minimum effective volume for hypertrophy, should one's caloric surplus be less aggressive than training to their MRV, so their maximal recoverable volume? So I guess at the start of your mesocycle, are we thinking because there's not as much stimulus for muscle growth, should we be eating less um, or should we just kind of scale it in a different way? What's your approach to that sort of thing, Mike? Yeah, so theoretically the answer is definitely yes. Um you might still be getting the same levels of muscle growth throughout the progression. It's something I'm going to kind of argue for a little bit in the book. Dr. Hoffman and I are co-authoring about the volume landmarks. I'm going to be making a, an argument, which I think is decent, that you get, as, as you progress from minimum effective volume to maximum recoverable every mesocycle, more or less every week, you, you tend to see pretty equivalent muscle growth. Nothing, at least to write home about, as being very, very different. Um, so it's not that there's more muscle growth training in MRV or close to approaching MRV, but the total caloric burden of such training is higher, right? Because it requires more energy. You're literally just doing more work. And also um, the amount of, uh, you know, sort of molecular machinery involved in recovery itself starts to kind of rise pretty exponentially towards MRV, right? And that's one of the reasons we do have a maximum recovery volumes. After a while, you just get overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. Close to that, you actually you you have to burn quite a few calories recovering, as well as just attending to that much training volume. Um, individuals have been asking myself and yourself kind of this question um, repeatedly, so I think it's a good idea to kind of uh, to so take it on here at length. And that is, you know, should because volume increases from microcycle to microcycle. And this question applies to people even just using uh, intensity-based volume progression rather than a sets-based volume progression. Like if you're just rising the, the weight, technically sets times, reps times weight, you know, was going up. So, you know, it's going to be something to that. Well, sh the question is, should calories go up on a mass phase through the phase? Or some other people say, you know, should carbohydrates go up? The answer is yes. But if we see like the whole answer from here to here, um, as the reason calories should go up, the part about you doing more volume each cycle is like some part of that down here. There's other parts that we have to mention. So for example, how fast is your metabolism increasing? Because in a mass phase, every week you eat at a hypercaloric diet, your metabolism tends to go up in speed, um, especially for a while. Um, and uh, kind of the closer you get to your previously established limit of body weight, the more your metabolism tends to speed up even faster. Um, regaining lost weight is pretty easy. Going to a new high requires some really serious eating um, because there is a set point or a settling point about metabolism both up and down, right? So trying to get much heavier is actually, you know, is it going to basically cause more meta metabolic uh, increase, et cetera. The other factor is that your body weight is going up. Um, this whole time. So when you say, well, metabolism increases uh, because uh, the body's kind of fighting the weight gain, but it also increases simply because there's more body to fight the weight gain, right? There's just more food to coming in. And then you set all of those basically fundamental three factors, increasing volume, metabolic increases due to uh, uh, adaptation and metabolic increases due to body size increase. And you factor them into the already very stochastic body weight fluctuations due to body water now made more stochastic by the excessive or excessive large amount of carbohydrate, salt and water that's being consumed and the excessive amounts of those things being burned in high volume training, again, 
both ways going up and down really far. In addition to that, you have cheat meals more frequent on mass, which tend to, you know, have even more salt and carbohydrates to bloat people up. So then at the end of that process, if you're saying, okay, so I'm going to increase by 50 grams of 25 grams of carbs per day uh, because my volume is going up by X amount, you may realize that you're under 100 grams of carbs, what you should be eating by the end of the fourth week because of the other increases. And you may be because the increases weren't as big as you expected because you were unable to estimate them in any real way. Maybe you made a pretty big mistake. So I think the best way to go about massing is you're going to increase calories on the regular anyway. So start with something that increases, that goes hypercaloric right away. Whatever figure you like to use, whether it's plus 500 or plus 250 or plus 150, whatever, start there. And then as the cycles go through, you'll notice, especially if your weight averages are relatively stable, which they should be week to week, that your weight gain starts to kind of peter off after about a week. And then you want to bump it. And how many bumps you need, because there's a lot more variables in there like metabolic speed, blah, 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 than just volume increases, how many bumps you need is, is, is that the answer to that is by no means clear. Um, is it every week? You know, could be every two weeks. Could be you start massing and your body doesn't make a whole lot of adaptations uh, to the, the amount or you miscalculate it and ends up being that you never need to bump, right? Because bumping up calories also assumes that we guessed correctly on the first one. Imagine your first bump was 750 plus just by accident, right? Uh, and then you, what are you going to do? Keep bumping from there? That's kind of insane, right? So maybe it's going to take three weeks for you to level off and then, oh shit, then, you know, mesocycle is almost over. So, Yes, you theoretically should be increasing carbohydrate and increasing total calories throughout your mass, but you may need to increase, uh, you know, uh, for numerous other reasons than just training volume. So yes, plan to increase, but let body weight be your guide, uh, especially if you're starting to measure. My recommendation is start measuring your body weight, or always measure it, but start tracking it as a beginning point about half a week into massing because before that you're getting so much glycogen and water and all the stuff and intramuscular bloating from higher training volumes. You don't even know what the hell is tissue and what's water. So it's a bad idea to be like, okay, like for example, you and I were just talking about this off camera for a second. I did a mini cut over the course of basically three weeks. I lost something like 16 pounds of, of scale weight. Now, I was super duper bloated to begin with because I was traveling a ton and eating McDonald's. And then um, now I'm super dry because I've been mini cutting and taking in somewhere between 200 and 300 grams of carbs a day and no cheap foods at all, doing cardio and training. And, uh, you know, did I lose 16 pounds of actual tissue? Fuck no. Like I lost maybe six. But then 10 is just plus or minus in the bloat. Not everyone's going to have 10 plus or minus in bloat. I'll tell you what, the kind of individuals, smaller individuals, um, more often hopefully drug-free individuals that tend to also use the slower progression models of gaining, like the Helmsian kind of approach, they're also the ones who are going to only be luckily maybe going two to three pounds in some direction after ma when massing begins just from body water. But to them, two or three pounds is like two or three months of gaining, right? So already it's super thrown off. So even for them, just as much as someone like myself who gains on the faster end of things, it's a good idea. Give yourself a week, half a week to a week of massing, and then start being like, okay, here's my, especially when your weight settles on the scale, you know, because the first day it'll go up by like two pounds. And you're like, what the hell? Uh, time to start eating less. No, it's not time to start eating. And once it starts to settle, like if it never settles after a week and it keeps going up, you're way too hypercaloric and you got to start bringing things down. But if it settles and then it starts to go up very slowly or not at all, then you kind of know, okay, here's where we're starting. Here's the body. So, so, you know, I anticipate I'm currently 227, 226 pounds. I think in a couple of days I start massing tomorrow. So I think by, so this is Thursday, right? That we're recording this mm -hmm. by by month by Tuesday, um, I will probably be uh, somewhere in the mid two thirties. But I'm not sure if it's going to be two thirty two or if it's going to be two thirty seven. I have no idea. So and that'll be a stable kind of day to day weight of around somewhere in the two thirties. So am I like 
uh, you know, I talked to my coach Broderick about this. I'm like, you know, are we planning to get to 240 or are we planning to get to 250 or 245? And, and it all depends on how much I weigh in that first week, you know, because if I weigh 238 in the first week, like, yeah, we're going to be pushing it close to 250 in, over this course span of, you know, eight to 10 weeks. Um, if I'm closer to, you know, something like, you know, 231, yeah, closer to just 240, maybe to 245, you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. I think people, planners, just like you and me and a lot of people that watch these interviews and, and are subscribers to you in general, Steve, I think we all get ahead of ourselves and being like, okay, this mass phase, I'm going to weigh this, but the next one, I mean, you have no idea what you're going to weigh, so just, it's, it's got to be some kind of restraint to the ecological, you know what I mean? Like, you got to start when your measurements are realistically implying what the status of the system is. It's like planning repairs on a spaceship that's arriving back to port and you lost contact with them because they were in a super space battle. You know they survived and you know they're on their way in, but in the atmosphere they can't tell you how bad their spaceship is damaged. You can't really plan repairs. you got to be like, let's see when the motherfucker lands and see if it's like half the thing is missing or if there's a couple scrapes, right? Any amount of planning, you know, people see planning as a good thing. Like, oh, but you got to have a plan, a general plan. Your plan is to be to mass and it can even be, I'm, I want to mass you know, up four kilos over the next eight months or something like that, right? But but uh, that four kilos, where you start uh, that four kilos is, is by no means clear until you get into the process. What do, what do you think about that? You got anything to add on that? I think, I mean, just listening to it is absolutely fascinating. Um, keeping up with it, I'm sure people who are listening who, I mean, I'm sure they're being able to keep up with it, but there's a lot going on and a lot to take in. But a lot of the time I find with those sort of, those because there's so many different adaptions, so much is happening. And sometimes you just have to go, whoa, 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 take a step back, look at kind of some smaller details, like the body weight progressions, things like that, and then just go off that rather than trying to calculate every single minor detail. Um, but I definitely related that. And people tend not to think about the adaptions upwards. They often think of like when they diet, though, they understand, okay, the metabolism ramps down. We have to eventually decrease um, calories even further to keep that deficit going. And we do that via looking at the scale and seeing how progress is going. Whereas they don't necessarily always think about it when they're gaining. They kind of just kind of just think it just you, you don't you have an amount and you just keep gaining. Um, so I think it's a, an easy way to think about it is like we don't try and calculate every single adaption that happens within the body. It would be virtually impossible. Um, but having the idea and the knowledge that that is going on and then looking at the scale as a marker helps tremendously. And we talked about it. And I think it's probably come up quite a lot with us recently because Broderick came on and talked about how kind of we need this as volumes coming up, this increase in uh, carbohydrates, which you touched on as well. And mm. it was just very interesting to hear about kind of obviously the metabolism comes up and things like this. Mm. Something I would add is something I've definitely noticed in myself and with clients is sometimes you'll be building, building, building calories. And then there'll be a point, And I remember for me, after my last prep, it was like 3000 calories. And I just gain consistently. My body just mm -hmm wouldn't like because people talk about oh you can just ramp up your calories forever almost endlessly and build your metabolism um i don't think that quite works does it mike no not at all well it's like just trying to think you know the opposite could be then true that we could ramp our calories down slowly and end up only needing to subsist on a thousand calories a day at healthy body weight well that would solve world hunger pretty quickly if something <laughs> figure that out um, now all these are transient increases um that the illusion that you can ramp up your metabolism to a sort of a super physiological state um, has developed from individuals who assume they are at a normal physiological state, but they are in fact, to some extent, over dieted. When those individuals start to ramp up their metabolism, a lot of that return or, or a lot of that increase is simply a return to normal states that they have long forgotten. And they say, oh my God, I can just keep doing this and keep not gaining weight, but eating more and more. And a lot of the times they snacking reduces extra little spoonfuls reduce because they're no longer diet fatigued a lot of times um they just do better with they don't cheat as much you know because there's no point in cheating if you're getting a lot of food in your diet anyway and then at the, at the end of it and the net balance is one of those results that you know if you actually held them in a in a, a sort of a calorimetry chamber it didn't after six months after three months, they're up significantly in calories. Another three months after, they're probably insignificantly up. Another three months after, they're not up at all. So even though that entire time they're thinking, I'm eating so much more food, 
but because, you know, a, a couple of cheat meals a week, you don't count that as your diet, but it sure as hell is as far as calories mm-hmm. are concerned. So you say, I can't believe I'm eating 150 grams of carbs per meal. Well, like, how many cheat meals a week are you having? Like, I'm not like, I don't know, cheat foods, but I've had enough of it. Like just once every other week. Well, when you first stopped your diet, you were having cheat meals every three days or every two days. And then certainly the net calories and just not as different as one would think. Mm-hmm. I think also I'd, I'd like to add that with – this approach in mind is kind of maybe being a little bit more proactive with your increases in calories kind of with the diet as it's going along. And I found I I've had it in the past where I haven't been proactive with it. And I've kind of been like, Oh, if I'm stable this week, it's not such an issue. I might come up the week after. And then sometimes it will be stable for a few weeks. And I'll be like, Oh, I'm sure I'm a calorie surplus. My training is going okay. I'm sure I'm gaining. And often it's led to me just basically maintaining and not seeing any real progression there. And sometimes I think, kind of having this idea in mind where these progressive increases might be something that you kind of have foresight with can help actually just make sure you really do progress and the scale weight does come up because I find a lot of the time people will they'd be a bit fat phobic with this sort of thing and they try and almost they they enjoy seeing that their weight's maintaining and then they just end up actually for months almost not gaining especially when they're only trying to gain say I mean some of their helms recommendations like a pound a month which i know for advanced bodybuilders that might be something more realistic but for a lot of people who maybe are a lot more novice than they realize this ends up leading to them spinning their wheels because they're like oh like i could like a a pound is really hard to track over even on a month if you're doing a lot of data collection yeah i mean i actually have um i have no idea how the pound a month thing works at all um I know plenty well how it works in theory, but I have no, no idea how it works in practice. Um, that being said, I think the resultant muscle growth that you could be getting at the fastest rates is for sure limited by your physiology. But what you want to do is have a little bit of an insurance policy to make sure that you're at least at peak growth rates. So two scenarios. One scenario is we stay in the lower side of calorie increases and maybe do kind of um, not a proactive approach like you're doing. And we end up gaining 75% of the muscle that we could have on a mass phase, but we stay fairly lean, which is good. The uh, next approach is to go a little bit, a little too proactive and gain 100% of the muscle we could have but gain a little bit more fat, uh, quite a bit more fat than, than we could have. And the question then is what to do about the fat? Well, it's been fairly well established that fat loss is easier than muscle gain in the sense that while muscle gain always comes with fat gain in anyone but you know, some exceptional cases, um, fat loss almost never comes with muscle loss unless you really fuck it up <laughs> or some exceptional cases. Another thing is that the rates are very different. Muscle gain is slow process. And I think a lot of people mistake my advice for a pound a week weight gain as me thinking that's going to be all muscle. You'll be lucky if it's 25% muscle, but getting rid of the fat after is easy as fuck because you can lose two pounds of fat per week on a mini cut for three weeks. No problem. Almost everyone can do that. Um, and th- you're down six pounds of fat and no muscle. And I think a combination of, you know, so a gentleman named uh, Jason Van Epps uh, is a, you know, uh, evidence-based performance coaching has, has uh, garnered a couple of studies, uh, especially on obese individuals, very untrained individuals, people that don't even train with weights that don't train with weights. Okay. Mind you, they are fairly aggressive dieting. Even they don't lose lean body mass exactly like you would expect. Greg Knuckles has shown pretty convincingly that because of myonuclear domain and a couple of other qualities of muscle to retain its uh, sort of, I don't want to say memory because it's such an overused bro term, but to retain sort of, uh, sort of its you know, plasticity to past states that um, you know, even if you lose some glycogen intramuscular water, even if you lose a little bit of contractile tissue, within like four days of going back to maintenance or mass, you get all of that back. Mm-hmm. So 
you know, if you're erring on the side of always less, you have the benefit of being in a little bit of better shape all the time, fat wise. Okay. But if you err on just a little bit on the side of more, I'm not talking about smash, you know, you know, an extra kilo per week of weight gain, but you know, an extra half pound here and there. I mean, let's put it this way. If you're massing for eight weeks and you gain an extra half pound of, of fat, pure fat, over those eight weeks, how long do we have to return you back? Well, if that's a total of four pounds, that's two fucking weeks of mini cutting. That's nothing. And with two extra weeks and in a more proactive gain rate, you've guaranteed that you're exploiting 100% of muscle gain as opposed to being on the lower end of things and just convincing yourself that everyone that gains weight faster is on drugs. Mm -hmm. um, which seems to be a common recourse. Um, and, 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 and that's just, uh, you know, there's examples of people on drugs doing the same thing. They'll take drugs and they'll be like, the drugs are great. They're working and they don't eat enough. And they're like, Oh man, I'm so big. This is my biggest ever off season, but a lot of it is drug bloat. And then they start dieting for the show and drop the drug bloat. And they look the fucking same, same show next year, the same. And people are like, how was your off season? And they're like, I didn't get fat. They're like, hey, that's awesome. Also, you look like shit. You know, it's like, ah, damn it. Now, obviously, it, it's like, um, I don't want to be excoriated here for arguing for the middle ground. That's really all I'm arguing. You know, we're not talking mm -hmm. about like football camp off season gain twenty pounds in a month ridiculousness for sure. And here's another thing: there is pretty convincing body of literature that gaining excessive quantities of fat can make and multiply the number of fat cells you have. It can make future um, uh, total physiology more resistant to weight loss. It can lead to, to you know, a, mis, a misregulation of leptin, ghrelin, and all those things. Um, and it can actually cause uh, you know, really unsightly kind of tissue uh, deformation so that you'll have like, um, you know, stretch marks and you'll have, um, what are those called? Like hanging skin, right? Loose mm -hmm. skin. Um, that's true, but you have to gain a really impressive amount of fat in an impressive amount of time for almost all of those to take hold. I've never seen anyone do it where they follow two rules. Don't gain much faster than a pound per week on average. And two, um, don't ever lose sight of your abs completely. If you do that, you're just not going to have any of those problems. It's, it's really unlikely. And if you follow the, those two rules as the extremes, and I say stay within them, then you, you to a, a large extent, will guarantee that you're getting all you can out of the muscle gain process, and the fat loss process is so straightforward that it's available whenever you need it. I have to, like, it just rings true to me completely. And I think something that is really, really important that I think a lot of people don't necessarily remember is the fact that what you ever advocate if they do think is aggressive you never advocate someone gets fat they're not actually getting kind of completely out of shape you've said you're, you're keeping your abs pretty much intact that's still in really good shape you just then cut down maybe a bit sooner than if you were taking the very slow approach for sure and as far as timelines I mean, with some of the very extremely slow approaches, um, the timeline is probably faster. So the mass plus mini cut all takes less time than the super slow mass. Yes. Uh, sometimes by a matter of like, you know, half. Uh, so it becomes one of those things where you just get, I think, more out of the whole process. Um, you know, I myself and myself and Nick Shaw, when we were really ballooning up in weight, we both got way too fat. I got way too, I have stretch marks. I have loose skin. Like mm -hmm. that's how fat I am, like in just a couple of areas, but I got way too fat. So I saw the other side of that personally. Uh, so I don't need to be told that it's not a good idea to get too fat. I know very much from personal experience, but there's a big way between getting too fat and kind of maintaining your weight at nothing or more than likely not to nothing, but to results that could have just been better. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah, I always, I kind of come back to the analogy and I'm not sure it's necessarily the best analogy because I don't think it's necessarily true for like the case of the analogy, but it's kind of like staying in the middle lane versus kind of switching lanes on the motorway um, in, in Europe or in, at least in England, we have the motorway or you guys have um, highways. Freeway. Uh, freeways, mm -hmm. that's the one. So same difference kind of 
actually kind of skipping and kind of jumping, changing lanes to try and get ahead versus just staying in one lane and trickling along. Now, kind of hopefully the guy that's maneuvering and doing kind of more interesting, more planning kind of approach is going to get there a bit faster than the person who's just tricking along in that middle lane, which could just be stuck in traffic. Um, but I, I, whether it's true in that actual scenario, I'm not sure. But in what we're talking about, I think that I, I think there's a strong case for it, at least with what I've seen. For sure. I think in that case, you know, the uh, people will say, well, it's a safety issue. <laughs> um, but there's no safety issue in gaining too fast. Uh, I would say it's more like um, I think the analogy could be strengthened with a race car driver that uh, doesn't accelerate on the the straightaways but it doesn't slow down for the turns nice. he just goes i'm just going to have an average speed and the average speed is like it'll get you around the track but you're not going to win any races doing that uh, winning races requires accelerating and decelerating at strategic times which you know of course has its risks but it wins you races so yeah and if you're a competent driver it doesn't mean you're going to crash the fucking car into the wall 100 percent of the time or something like that so, no I exactly hope. Awesome. I think we actually beat that question to death, which is really good. And I, I think people will take a lot away from that discussion. Hopefully, when that question comes up again, we can kind of link this and it's pretty comprehensive. So um, we can get them onto here. So yeah, brilliant job, Mike. Really, really good. Um, Likewise. So the next, thank you. The next question is from Patrick Johnson, uh, who I know you know, because um, he asks questions all the time. Patrick Johnson. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. I think he's in like... For sure. Camo army, I think it's military it's guy. Absolutely, yeah. yep. Um, and he wanted to know. I know he's he's asked me this question a few times, and he may have even asked. He said, "Ask him on direct, direct, sorry, ab training for a bodybuilder." Um, I think his thoughts were he'd seen that you commented about how, as a bodybuilder, do you need to directly train your abs because it makes the waist potentially thicker and that might not be a look that you want. I believe that was what his discussion was. So he wants a kind of recap of that discussion? Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure. Has he already asked you about it? Have you already given him the last? I, I don't lowdown? think so. I don't, I, don't, I don't remember telling him what I think about that. Um, I think it kind of depends on what kind of genetics you have for abs. It depends on what division you're competing in and it depends on how you're training your abs. Um, I think that if you are in some of the divisions that are like men's physique, um, and maybe classic, but well, okay. So men's physique, right. I think that in that division, you are best served. Sorry, I had to plug in my phone. No worries. Um, in men's physique, you are judged on how your abs look and to some extent if they pop out or not. They want people's abs to pop out to some extent in that division. So, yeah, for them, it's a good idea if, to do a bit of ab training. If you have the kind of genetics and the kind of look that requires your abs to be bigger because they're not. You know, some people just kind of flat abs. Um, females in women's physique, they like to see, from what I understand, well-developed um, abdominal, rectus abdominis, uh, front-facing abdominals, uh, on the female physique athletes. So a lot of females tend to have kind of the more flat abs look, which a lot of females in recreational fitness value a lot, but in physique, they really want to see them pop. So then, yeah, train abs, train them with weights like normal to hypertrophy them. If you are a bodybuilder in the classic physique division, um, then you're required to hit a vacuum pose, or at the very least, it looks much better when you do. Having big abs probably doesn't help you at all in that pose, and I'm not so sure it would be a good idea. For women's figure and bikini, having abs that pop out is usually considered a negative. They want a streamlined waist, so training abs for them might not be a great idea. In men's bodybuilding, the heavier you get, the more likely it is that your abs are already pretty big from training with really heavy weights. 
And big bodybuilders just pretty much almost never train their abs. And it's really rare. Um, and if you're a smaller bodybuilder, you know, you got a portion of your MRV or, or fractions of your, or your MRV or fractions of your volume tolerance, whatever you're going up to intelligently. And it's, I haven't seen too many bodybuilders where I was like, guys, what he really needs to prioritize is his abs. Forget about his back or his chest or his arms. You're just getting bigger. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So that's my best answer is that, you know, if you're involved in bodybuilding and you, you're, you're trying to be as jacked as possible, uh, you know, training abs is probably not really necessary um, or beneficial. If you're in men's physique, probably a good idea. If you are in classic bodybuilding, you might want to stay away from ab training and replace ab training with technique training to work on your vacuum pose. And that's uh, very interesting. I have no idea how to do that, but there are other people that do that really well and they have exercises, breathing exercises to help you hit a vacuum, hold it, then relax. Cause it's different musculature that does that all together. And um, it hold it in different poses. You learn how to hit a vacuum. That'll, that'll do you a lot of good in classic physique. And, and if your bodybuilding can still hold a vacuum, great. Then, no ab training for you. That's so, really interesting. Please. No, I definitely. I think a lot of the time I kind of programmed ab training because some of my clients wanted it in the past. And then you'd have people, you'd program it and they'd just be like, by the way, Steve, I've just not done abs. Like if there's anything you don't have time for, it's the thing that goes first. And if you do have time, like a lot of the time, maybe you do have more you could put onto your arms or onto your delts that is probably better served or you'd at least appreciate more than and it's more fun than training your abs ab training generally is not much fun um so yeah and interesting you talked about the vacuum pose because i think i recently heard ben podolsky talking about um a client of his he i think he said for every vacuum pose you do i'll give you a gram of carbohydrates so we had to do like 300 vacuum practices to get a 300 grams of carbs. Um, but yeah, likewise, I have no idea how to, I actually don't know how to hit a vacuum, let alone um, try and do those things. Definitely interesting. And I think it's good for people to take away that they don't necessarily need to train their abs. I think a lot of people think, oh, it's a must. Um, or other people are exactly the other end and they think there's no point. But there's all, like everything, there's always a middle ground. So yeah, brilliant answer. Um, so Diana Leal has asked, can you talk about strategies for muscle hypertrophy in women? Quite a broad question. Mm -hmm. Almost all the, uh, they're almost all identical. Just, uh, make sure to, if you're a female, there's going to be some derivations from male strategies that you're going to want to be keen on. First of all, because you're precluded to gain muscle is going to be lower, you don't want to go through the same kind of weight gain and uh, loss cycles. It's going to be contracted. Um, you're not going to lose weight as fast. You're not going to gain weight as fast. You're not going to be as aggressive about stuff. Um, in the Renaissance diet or the uh, Renaissance woman female diet book, we put that at about two thirds the speed of males of the same size. I think that's a safe bet. If you gain two-thirds as fast, uh, you lose two-thirds as fast, just about that. Um, in females, training frequency is going to be recommended to be higher per muscle group because muscles recover really quickly in females compared to males. And uh, with females, so so one thing that really just is, is a huge pet peeve of mine that it like it just makes me just angry beyond fucking anything else is um, a female, and I've had females email me before with this exact sort of situation. They like be doing a bro split because their boyfriend or their husband or their fiance or just some guy they know, just they're training with them. And, you know, I think that, uh, you know, for the most part, especially in modern times, the idea of the patriarchy or female oppression in modern countries is basically hogwash for the most part. I think there are some trace elements of it in some very male dominated areas and it's not so much patriarchy as it is male tradition and the assumption that females need the same thing. It's actually a very egalitarian assumption. So, okay, we'll just train them the same. But um, it ends up being that, you know, for a woman to train her pecs once a week 
I mean, she could be training it four times a week and be just by do so much better, right? Because recovery is super not an issue, and the FSR curves probably fall off really fast. Um, so it's one of those situations where for females, uh, I think that you know um, the average training frequency for females should be three to five times per week per muscle group. Uh, and for males, two to four times per week, average. Right? So a lot of females will train literally everything hard three times a week. So a pretty interesting female program is upper body, lower body, three each three times a week. And different emphases every day, obviously, um, but uh, yeah, three times a week. So make sure that frequency is up there to, of course, no more than you can tolerate uh, or no more than you can't no longer tolerate, but um, frequency should be higher. And uh, your sort of per week volume amounts as far as the number of sets is going to be absurd because that's going to be, um, you know, uh, females have MRVs often between 25 and 30 sets per week. Um, and advanced females have minimum effective volumes of 15 to 20 sets per week. So that means an advanced female can train with 12 sets per week and just straight up not grow. <laughs> She'll barely notice it. I mean, it doesn't get sore at all, no disruption seemingly, and barely a pump. Uh, females need more relative volume, we can call it, more mm -hmm. sets. On average, of course, there are exceptions to this for sure, and you got to find your own values. We've talked about that a whole bunch. Um, and then, uh, so you know, those are kind of the main points as far as making sure your training uh, is on the mark as a female is. Um, and also just one last little kind of cool tip. A lot of weights and like stacks are going to be such uh, big loading differences, like 10 kilos on the, you know, pull down is the difference between the sets of 15 and sets of five. Mm -hmm. So you can't really do, you know, microcycle one was microcycle two, 60 kilos, microcycle three, seven, uh, by the end you're doing one rep maxes or partial reps. So uh, females can benefit from alternative modes of progression. And you've written a lot about the subject. Um, and I've written a little bit. I've done some pretty cool seminars recently. Uh, one of the ones I did in Australia, I did a lot of seminars on alternate modes of progression. But just a couple of them to summarize is going up in weight every two microcycles, but going up in reps every microcycle, every two microcycles as well. So for example, use a weight for sets of 10, micro one, same weight sets of 12, micro two. Go up in weight, but down in reps, sets of 10 for the heavyweight, micro three, sets of 12 for the heavyweight, micro four. That makes sense? Yes. So an adjustment that can be made, uh, and uh, you, know, you can also do total rep counts. So for example, you got a dumbbell that's you know, 20 kilos, and you're doing one-arm rows with it. And 25 kilos is fucking absurd, and you can only do like two reps. But you can do 10s with 40, all right, or 20 kilos. So what you do is a total of... 40 reps per workout uh, week one, 45 total reps in week two, 50 reps week three, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You can also play with rest times. Just make sure your total volumes don't drop off. So a variety of those progression models, especially when you don't have access to barbells, dumbbells, and, 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 um, and uh, stack machines oftentimes are too big uh, of jumps to make intelligently. Um, if you're really hardcore, super dedicated, you can buy magnetic plates that stick onto dumbbells. I've done that before, two and a half pound and one, one and a quarter pound plates. Um, you can do that. Uh, that's a cool idea, but you can also get away with these alternative progression strategies if you're female and find that the, the dumbbells um, and stuff just go up by these enormous increments. Um, and then lastly... Um, it's not as clear that this occurs, but even even all those factors being adjusted for, I think that um, females tend to be able to execute um, longer accumulation cycles and have more sort of profound accumulation to deload paradigms. Um, so a female may be able to um, progressively overload for six to eight weeks and then deload for one. Um, or if she overloads for four weeks or three three or four weeks, she may only need to deload for half a week. 
the reason I don't like to deload for parts of a week is because it throws off your program design like crazy. Mm-hmm. Like, new program starts Thursday. And like, Second Thursday? What the fuck? Like, did it start Thursday last time? Like, oh, started Monday last time, but it's three and a half weeks long. You know, like, you got to go to the gym at different times. Like, we all like to have set schedules. Like, you know, Friday is my pull day and Saturday's push. And it's if it's the other way around or if it's a joint train side, you know, there's other times of the week I can't train. So if you structure it using weeks, then you end up having to say, well, it's a week of deload. It has to be, okay. Um, and then that means that the accumulation phase length can change to accommodate. So if you know you have a week to deload, and you know that you can uh, accumulate fatigue for quite a long time until it becomes deleterious because you drop it so quickly, even at overloading um, volumes and intensities, then maybe you can run a six to one paradigm. And just because your boyfriend deloads every three weeks doesn't mean you should be. Fee is a modern world. Females need to attend to their own needs. Um, advise females not to look into too much is the intricacies of their. Um, uh, of their cycles, of their menstrual cycles, and planning training around that. I found that the theoretical basis is relatively sound. In practice, you almost never notice the difference of who yeah. fuck knows. Like, um, the thing is, is especially if you're bodybuilding, you get lean enough, your menses go away anyway, so that becomes a non, non-issue towards the end of contest prep. So um, I think people tend to turn to overvalue the uh, menstrual differences there and say, okay, it's the week of my period. I got to really take it easy. It's like, you don't have to really take it easy. And I think auto regulation takes care of most of that anyway. Like yeah. what is two from fail is going to be a little harder on some weeks than others. And that's, that's uh, takes care of itself. So I think that this idea of planning like crazy around menstrual cycles is sort of overvaluing the differences between males and females. No, I think the other thing to add to that, that I miss anything I don't think so. I think that was brilliant. You covered training and nutrition. I think really if from what I was summarizing from that was nutrition is basically be less aggressive. Um, and with the training aspect, you can be more aggressive. But if you start with the yep. principles in mind and you have auto regulation in place, you think about your SRA curves, your individual SRA curves and your maximum recoverable volume and progressions, then you'll it'll sort it all itself out as long as you kind of do actually individualize it to yourself. I thought I'd just add a tidbit in that you talked about kind of the menses and the cycle and kind of I've thought about it, especially with my powerlifters. I'm like, sometimes they're kind of coming to the end of even maybe um, going to a powerlifting meet. I've had them and they should be on their period and stuff like that. And in reality, it's actually never had an impact. And if anything, it's just more mental than anything else. And it stressed them out thinking that it could have an impact. And when we've just not focused on it, and I've been like, right, we've just gone through like two mesocycles. I haven't asked you about your period at all. Did you notice anything? Because during the weeks of training, everything went smoothly. From my perspective, I didn't want to ask you because it could potentially make you think about things. They haven't noticed. So it might just be the small number of women that we both work with. But for the most part, I've not seen a problem with that. For sure. Cool. Um, I think we've got time for one more question, unless it's a really short question. Uh, so we go for it, and it's Lucas, Lucas Rakowski has asked a question about supplements and to be more specific, nutrient repartitioning agents. Uh, what are your thoughts on these, Mike? And if you think they are effective, which one should you add to your supplement regime? What the fuck is a nutrient repartitioning agent? I was hoping you would know, Mike, um, but the fact you don't. Says I'm kind a lot. of joking. I sort of know. Oh. <laughs> I'm sort of a quarter, a quarter joking, seven five percent serious. So there's a bunch of these things that are called. So nutrient repartitioning is the idea that you normally get a certain amount of food that goes to a variety of physiological endpoints: like, uh, fueling of the body for daily tasks, the construction of fat tissue, the construction of muscle tissue, and everything in between. Nutrient repartitioning agents are supposedly pharmaceutical substances you take that alter how much nutrient goes to fat, how much goes to muscle, how much goes to everything else. Um, some of these that uh, don't, a lot of them just just purely bullshit. I don't know what the fuck they even put in those pills. Probably just steroids. Uh, <laughs> uh, so unless you want to just take drugs, don't don't take those. Or or they're just getting either steroids or just nothing that works. Some of the some of the products described as nutrient repartitioning agents 
are like insulin sensitizers. They improve your insulin sensitivity and thus secondarily may allow you to upload um, sort of your muscular uh, glucose more than glucose to fat, etc. Now, the everything but but pharmacological grade stuff works very very small amount. Like chromium picolinate, for example. Like if you're a little bit deficient in chromium. It can make you a little bit more insulin sensitive from what I understand. The degree to which it does that is tiny. You know, if you get pharmacological, uh, you know, path for that is something like metformin. Uh, and it's the effect is like at least 10 or 100 times more than, than uh, you know, chromium. You know, when you're diabetic and you show up to your type 2 diabetic, you show up to your doctor's office, he doesn't say, say you take some chromium pills, yeah. okay? Uh, he gives you metformin. So... Um, the thing is the most powerful, so, so that's it, you know, pretty much there's like, you know, some amino acids in some cases have been shown to improve sensitivity, blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah, the stuff doesn't work all that great and it's not nothing to write home about. Um, the biggest effects in drug-free athletes on nutrient partition are going to be your training sensitivity and your nutrient sensitivity, mostly based on your body fat. So if you've been training to gain muscle with high volumes and you're excessively fatigued and used to high volumes, your fiber type has changed to more, more type one type activity versus type two type activity, slower to faster. So faster twitch has changed to slower twitch, which takes weeks to change back, by the way. Um, uh, then, you know, you're in need of a maintenance phase. Your nutrient partitioning sucks. So every extra calorie you eat is more likely just going to go to muscle and muscle is going to be like, I don't need this. I'm not doing shit. And then it's going to go to fat instead. Um, and of course there's how lean you are, right? If you're super lean, your muscle tends to soak up more nutrients. If you're super fat, your muscle tends to not soak up more nutrients. Pretty standard. Uh, so as a drug free athlete, I would very much focus on those things, making sure you're intelligent, your training is intelligent and programmed to never be trying to hypertrophy or do high volumes for too long. And of course, never doing low volumes for too long. If you really want to grow for about a month or two of low volumes, you're about as resensitized as you're going to be. And, you can be really sensitized if you do more volume. Um, and, and in addition to that, uh, you know, make sure that you're not ever getting super duper fat. And when you do get a little too fat, uh, abs start to be a little, um, you know, do I have abs or not kind of situation, usually about 15% body fat, then you whittle your way back down to 10-ish or a little bit below and work your way back up. That's really going to keep you um, partitioning nutrients in a way that is the rest of it is determined by your genetics and your training. Um, but obviously, the most powerful nutrient partitioning agents are anabolics. Um, you know, general uh, class of uh, so androgens, right? Testosterone. It's uh, all the anabolic steroids are all the derivatives. Uh, make it so that you just put on more muscle, no matter what you eat, uh, than you otherwise would. And uh, some of them even have some have that indirect because you know because muscle gets more fat automatically gets less. It's like the kid left out without a seat because the classroom rushes in and everyone gets a seat. But there's also some anabolics have pretty distinctly demonstrated uh, literal anti-fat properties, like directly suppressing fat fat anabolism or directly promoting fat burning. That that's a hell of a that's a hell of a drug. Um, trenbolone acetate comes to mind as one of those, or trenbolone and its its class of esters. Um, you know, it's probably going to kill you in five years, but hey, you'll be super lean before then. <laughs> uh, and jacked, it's great. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, and then the other class that comes to mind pretty uh, instantly is growth hormone. So, growth hormone or its various peptide derivatives um, have a profound uh, anti anti lipogenic property. You eat a shitload of food, growth hormone just doesn't really let you get fat like you used to before you started taking it. Um, and it burns fat like a motherfucker too when you're dieting, but when you're massing, it just doesn't let you get as fat so you could keep massing for longer and or more aggressively uh, and still continue to gain muscle. Um, insulin, which a lot of bodybuilders take to get enormously huge, isn't actually a repartitioning agent because it just shits into everything, right? It, it makes you fatter and more muscular. But if you take insulin with an anabolic and a growth hormone or a derivative, you end up having this effect where not only does the anabolic just make everything go to more muscle, but growth hormone prevents you from getting very fat, and then insulin just multiplies that process for you as to the rate at which it's happening. 
that's a fucking nutrient you're partitioning combo. And shit is not sold in stores, okay? <laughs> Unless you live in like a, hey, to be completely honest, we keep saying that it's illegal. It's only illegal in some places. In the United Kingdom, a lot of that shit is actually completely legal for personal use from what I understand, which is completely <laughs> insane. Um, in like, I don't know, countries like Cyprus or something like that, you can just go to a pharmacy and buy the shit. <laughs> Thailand and shit. I'm living in the wrong fucking place, but uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. But um, I just go in and start eating random drugs, right? But um <laughs> You know, it's one of the situations where people, uh, you know, so some of the nerdier of us have seen, you know, the mention of nutrient partitioning primarily in anabolic research. So, for example, one place where you'll see that term is in feed studies on cattle. Like they'll give cattle trenbolone and the cattle eat the same amount of food, but more of it goes to making meat and less goes to making fat. So you have nutrient repartitioning phenomenal so they give cat cattle trend and then they come nice and meaty then we take that and it sounds very sciencey and then supplement company executives unfortunately some of the less i don't know less ethical ones maybe less truthful ones will say new nutrient repartitioning agent beta alanine xz3 and you're like mm -hmm. oh that sounds really fancy you know nutrient repartitioning like yeah that shit doesn't really do much, man, unless you're on this either pharma or shit that's actually pharma and you just don't know about it. So if you're in a tested, to put this this way, if you're a drug tested bodybuilder or power lifter, don't you dare take anything that's called a nutrient partitioning agent because you'll either be cheating on purpose at that point or by accident at that point. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's funny. Um, uh, a lot of pro hormones and everything, and this is just a, a good public service announcement anyway. Um, every pro hormone it, almost every pro hormone that actually works uh, is just and it's oral. It's oral steroids. That's all it is. There's no such thing as pro hormones. It just doesn't make any sense uh, chemically. Um, and then the ones that don't work are just a fucking waste of your money because there's nothing in there, right? So people say like, "Ooh, I, know, I don't know about steroids, but I took like a pro hormone and I get fucking jacked." And I'm like, "Are your nipples sore?" And they're like, "Yeah." I'm like. <laughs> <laughs> We think that is, and they're like, well, I don't know, it's like whatever, 1AD3, no, it's fucking it's D, D, Dianabol, and you can stop right there. So you got to be really careful about supplements that have these, these sort of nebulous descriptions and exotic properties, unless it's one of the ones we know, like creatine, beta alanine, like if it's all these weird supplements, there's weird names or these crazy trippy effects, there's, there's a good chance there's drugs in there. And I'll tell you what, for those individuals listening and, and, and living in countries in which drugs are legal and okay to use, and then you're not cheating by using them in a drug test of federation, just use real drugs. You fucking buy a fucking pill. You don't even know what it's in there. They have to lie to you <laughs> twice, you know, lie about there not being drugs, and then you can't even trust them on what's in there. Just get the real thing. So, you know what I mean? It's one of those situations where uh, anytime people ask me about these exotic super supplements, um, there's some, here's another problem. I might as well, I might as well hit this one since I have a little bit of time. If that's okay with you, Steve, can I, okay. can I get this one out of the way as well? So, um, uh, selective androgen receptor modulators, SARMs, um, they actually did a really good study recently where they tested a shitload of different SARMs from a crap load of different companies, SARMs, right? And so what SARMs are supposed to do is they're kind of supposed to be uh, almost super steroids. So basically in the 19... Um, 60s to 1970s is where steroid um, manufacture and invention peaked. Uh, and what they were doing for a long time was they were trying to, so the, the testosterone molecule itself has anabolic effects. It grows muscle, which is what we want. And then it has a bunch of androgenic effects, some of which are cool, like it pisses you off so you can be better at strength athlete, athletics or it heals your nervous system faster. But others, like it raises blood pressure, it fucks your mood up, it gives you all these side effects. Fuck that. Nobody wants that. So they were developing for a long time uh, anabolics that had higher ratios of activity on the muscle growth side and just lower activities for everything else. One of the sort of the sort of tip of the spear for that generation of drugs is um, uh, methanolone, which is uh, primabolin. And primabolin is just it's it's not very strong by itself, but if you take enough of it, it just does a lot of muscle growth and just not a whole lot of anything else. It's funny enough, a lot of bros don't take it because they're like, I didn't feel shit. You're not supposed to feel shit, motherfucker. You can't feel your muscle growing. They're like, I don't know, it didn't piss me off. Like, is that good? They're like, no, man, I need something that works. Like, All right, never mind, you're an idiot. So, um, 
that kind of research kind of came to a halt because of the anti-drug sort of hysteria that built in the, especially in the eighties. And a lot of companies just like discontinued their, because nobody's buying these anabolics. Like, you know, doctors won't prescribe the anemia patients to hospitals anymore. Like they used to because of, Oh, you know, don't give me steroids. And the doctors are like, Oh, you know, they last time they heard about steroids in med school, they're like, Oh, those they kill people. Right. And then, so they kind of stop but in the nineties. Uh, in early 2000s, another line of research developed for a different class of compounds that does very much the same thing. So selective androgen receptor modulators, they were supposed to essentially affect, so the androgen receptors a lot of the way, not the only way, but it's a lot of the way in which anabolics have their effects. It's a receptor um, that's found inside, in, internally in the cell. The molecules clip onto it, and then that receptor en ends up communicating to the nucleus in some way, and the nucleus makes more muscle protein or helps you build, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, uh, there's androgen receptors in pretty much every tissue, like your testes, which makes your, your you know, your, your various parts of your brain that regulate how much, uh, you know, testosterone you produce, and your skin, which gives you pimples from, you know, too much drug use and all this other crap. So what they did with selective androgen receptor modulators is they basically engineered chemical compounds that pretty much bonded like 100 times more to muscle androgen receptors than they did to anything else, which is like a fun hell of a fucking discovery. And the, the laboratory research on them was like super impressive. Um, and it is super impressive. Like their anabolic androgenic ratio is unreal. They had names for a while that weren't even commercial names, and nobody named them. They were just like, it was like LHZ5710 or some shit like that. So supplement companies caught onto the shit, and your local neighborhood drug dealer caught onto the shit too, and they started selling SARMs. So recently they did a study where they collected a bunch of these things, and they tested them. I think one product out of like 15 or 20 had SARMs in it. Wow. All the other products, like half of them had just like Dianabol or methyl testosterone, just steroids, which have fucked up side effects. It's like the most fucked oh. up ones you can take, right? It's then even like exotic steroids, it's not even Anavar or something that it is the worst ones. And you're like, what the fuck? Because um, I've actually had people, I've talked to people who were like, man, I ran SARMs and my liver values went to hell and I got really puffy and bloated. I'm like, those are not SARMs. And they're like, really? I'm like, absolutely not. Are you out of your mind? So there's basically when people say like, Ooh, like, what do you think about SARMs? I don't think you can get SARMs is the answer unless you have a connect at a research lab. And if you do call me up, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm totally kidding. But, but it's, you know, it's one of those things that's just not on the market. They're not really on the black market. They're not on the non-black market. It's just not a thing yet. So are they around? Yeah. But what are the chances that you're taking them or the bottle from GNC that says SARM X actually has SARMs? Fucking minimal. So don't even bother. Um, you know, I asked Broderick about this at length and he said, look, man, maybe in five or 10 years, these things will come around, be used by bodybuilders. People will know where to find them and which ones work. But for now, it's a shit show and you have no idea what's going on. Um, one of those, and again, like pro hormones, SARMs are the new pro hormones, right? And people are like, whoa, do I go? can I use SARMs? And a lot of drug free people are trying to use SARMs because they're like, well, it's not steroid. Like, okay. yeah. It's much more advanced than a steroid. If you were cheating with steroids, you're really cheating with SARMs. Good news is you're probably not taking SARMs. So they <laughs> fucked up the cheating. Um, and they've, they've busted um, a couple of people at a very high level who had detectable amounts of SARMs in their blood, but they were also pop for other shit too, oftentimes. Mm -hmm. So you'd have no idea if that was even helping. And a lot of times, you know, you'll have tiny doses of them where you need much more to actually do anything. So uh, it's pro hormones, SARMs. And, you know, while we're at answering this question about um, what was that uh, nutrient repartitioning agents, uh, you're going to stay drug free and take normal supplements. So you come to the dark side and there's not much leeway in between. Unfortunately. Mm -hmm. No, I think that was really good. I think people, I mean, I, I, good. You brought up Broderick. Cause I think if people do want to learn more about a, a lot more about kind of drug use and things like that, he did a two part series with Juan McDonald, which was, I mean, I listened to it and so much went over my head, um, which is not surprising considering I haven't really delved into that area. Um, but I think in general, if it's something like, if it's a supplement you haven't really heard anyone talk about, Alan Aragon, Brad Schoenfeld, 3DMJ, you, Mike, and in your books and things like this, and it hasn't been spoken about, chances are you're not trying to hide anything. You're not trying to stop people gaining. 
you're just saving people time and money by not talking about something that doesn't need to be talked about. So um, yeah, brilliant, brilliant takeaway, brilliant uh, answers to all the questions today. I had a great time. Um, and yeah, thank you. And uh, we'll have to do this again. And I want to thank everyone for listening uh, to the show. And all, as always, keep actually, I keep getting tagged on my Instagram, on people's stories, people listen to the podcasts and people asking me when Mike's going to come on again. And um, things like this so yeah keep doing that we love it well might get Mike might get too much of it um, but I'm sure he he does love it really um, it's, it's and, all good absolutely yeah Mike's to be Mike's never said any bad words about it to me so I was just preempting that it might no get. no way <laughs> Mike loves what it. kind of this is my job what can I would if I wasn't answering questions in some form or another be it through books or templates or anything else or direct I mean I wouldn't have a job I, I'd have to get another job my my professor job is I answer questions for a living for God's sake uh, I hate questions stop asking <laughs> questions you know no of course keep them coming we'll, we'll take awesome. all the ones we can get to yeah Definitely. So yeah, just want to say a big thank you to everyone. And yeah, keep up, keep um, commenting, giving us reviews. It helps us every time. It makes us want to do this more. And uh, yeah, big thank you to everyone. So cheers, guys. And thank you very much to Mike.